like you know hair yeah everybody's worried about the haircut you can't tell on a bad webcam you know i've no, actually I've ordered i've ordered one of those not, yeah, you've done the good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no should i say uh, anyway we are live because there's people commenting already um so welcome luca vesti and fiona Cummings. thank you so much for joining me today and um Hey, the inter interface on my end has changed. That's interesting. They've, they've upgraded uh, Be Live. But um, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, and welcome to a, an, another afternoon of talking about books and where books take us in this in this um, strange world of staying in. Um, how are you both first? Fiona, how are you doing on all this? Um, if you'd asked me on Tuesday, I would have said I would have been crying merrily into my vodka because Tuesday was a terrible day in our house. Everyone was crying and shouting. Um, but today's a better day. Um, and I think probably like, I mean, you know, you can't speak for everybody, but I think like a lot of people, we have up and down days. <laughs> Um, yeah. And some days are better than others. Um, the thing I am finding um, really tricky is I've got two children, one, one 10 and one 11, who need a little bit of supervision. And so because of that, we've got school going on at home and I'm finding it quite tricky to write. And I think that might be because obviously there's a lot going on, but also because I'm just so distracted by the news. Yeah, yeah. How's about yourself, Luca? Uh, I mean, I've got a 14 and an 11 year old and, and what I've realized quite quickly is that they their schooling was very different to mine. In that, yeah, they're learning stuff that I didn't learn until I was, well, I hope I learn when I'm in like my 40s or 50s. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know any. It's, uh, it's, it's been a bit of an eye opener, but they yeah, seem yeah, to. Yeah, seven maths. I mean, it's just beyond. What me. is that? <laughs> oh, I, tried, I tried helping my children with maths years ago. They've grown up now, and what a mistake that was. You know, they really just, I mean, I, I just set them back years, frankly. Um, <laughs> Do they seem to be dealing with it better than I am and my wife is? They seem to be doing all right with it. I think they're just happy not to have to leave the house that much. Oh. Yeah, and, they've, yeah. and they've all got, you know, they've got their devices and, like, they can yeah. chat to their friends on Xbox or over their phones or iPods and all sorts of things. So they're happy. It's just me that's like, who are all these people exactly. in my house? <laughs> I'm used to spending time alone. Yes, I'm eating. Yes, I'm drinking. But, I'm, you know, I'm used to doing these things alone in secret. <laughs> <laughs> I love Pippa McAllister has just said help. I think she means hello, but just in case. Hello to everybody who's coming in. Uh, we have Germany, we have Norway, and hi, Davy Fennell, who hasn't said uh, hello, who lives up the road actually from me. Oh, um, hi. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's a great thing. You see, I don't see people like that anymore, even if they're living like, you know, several yards up the road. But anyway. Um, you mentioned, um, Fiona, the difficulties of writing. And actually, I came across this brilliant tweet today, just now, actually. Um, and I'm trying to put it in the screen there. And can I even read it? That would be a terrible mistake to put it there. Um, let me make my window bigger so I can. But anyway, Liz Nugent was complaining that she couldn't write for exactly the same reasons as you were just saying. So Kaz Freer mentions Alice Wu, the director, um, who's, who had a writer's block as well. So what she did was... She, gave, she wrote a check for $1,000 to the NRA, to the National Rifle, uh, Rifle Association, and she gave it to a best friend of hers and said, if I haven't produced a script in three weeks, send this check to the NRA. Oh, and we to produce a script. So this is what we need to do. Obviously, I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, yeah, I, I'm slightly concerned that even though it would go against everything I believed in, that that, that still might not get my book finished. Um, I just, I think it's, I'm just... You know, my mind is jumping all over the place. And I think, you know, I used to be, um, you know, a, a journalist full time. And I think I'm so consumed by the news. So I just re I'm just constantly looking at the news updates all the time as well. And I think that's very distracting. It makes it impossible to, you know, to to write much. But I, I do know lots of other writers, I think, are going through the same things. I, I am not a person who is baking sourdough bread. <laughs> um, I haven't learned to play, you know, the piano <laughs> or to speak Mandarin. I'm just getting more drunk. <laughs> you just raise your glass at that point because I have a cup of tea, but I'd just like to point out that Fiona has, what have you got, vodka and what? Grapefruit juice, pink grapefruit. And Luke is masquerading as a soft, soft drink. But I it's a soft drink. It's a soft drink, definitely. Just don't, 
I'm not driving after this, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> we've got nowhere to go, Luca, have we? No. We're all dressed up and ready to party, but we've got nowhere to go. <laughs> Apart from here, of course. Joy, Joy Clover said, love your hair, Fiona, so long. And uh, I see that Hugo um, from Norway says, nice haircut, Luca. Aye. So this we yeah, are it's just growing and growing and growing, but that's okay. I don't. I only go to the hairdressers about twice a year, anyway. Mainly when there's some crime festival coming up, <laughs> <laughs> which, which sadly is not going to happen. I mean, how no. much are you missing all that? And I think that's that. That's one of the hardest things because, you know, I I've realised how much. You know, and all of us who are involved in the crime community, be it writers or readers or bloggers, reviewers, everybody, how much I love seeing my crime friends and getting drunk with them and seeing the readers and doing the events and actually how much they make up of my my working year and how much I love it. Um, and so, you know, I think that actually has hit me much harder than I expected it to. I mean, I was, you know, you see it's so disappointing because obviously expected Harrogate to be cancelled and then obviously bloody scotland now and you know you're seeing these events getting later and later in the year and it's so disappointing and obviously luca you it wasn't just the events for you you know two crime um the fun loving uh crime writers yeah. have the full schedule this summer i mean you, to people who don't know luca plays in this in this it's it's a crime fiction super group <laughs> and, and they're brilliant much to everybody's surprise, I have to say. Do you know what I mean? Because the the worst thing is, isn't it, when when sort of dad bands and things get formed and, you know, you go, oh, God, yeah, it's lots yeah. of people I really admire and like, I'll go along and nod. But they're a rocking band. I mean, it, it was a surprise to us, to be fair. Um, <laughs> when we first rehearsed, I was convinced it was going to be awful. Um, and it really wasn't. And that was a huge surprise to us all. But we had, uh, I think, about eight gigs just before july and they've all gone uh, and then another two have gone in august now um we haven't scheduled anything between september and november december because uh val mcdermott our lead singer was going off to new zealand um but yeah that that we kind of planned <laughs> that's our social <laughs> night nights and it's all gone and all the festivals are gone um and it, it it's 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 something because we enjoy it so much as well it's a huge loss in our kind of calendar in our year's calendar um and it means that we have to you know sit at home and actually write books which is you know not as fun <laughs> uh, keith walters um who's been here coming to lot says fiona i'm loving rattle despite the fact it's creeping me out <laughs> thank you i'm going to come back to rattle and, and things like that but we also got one from, from um hugo who says how's your walking up hills project going luca now this is something I don't know about. <laughs> Last year I started walking up hills. I, it was something that I never did before because it just why would you? It's a hill, you know. It's big, um, and I went up Malfamer in uh, in Wales and, um, and and a couple of others and stuff, and um, and I really enjoyed it. There's a nice view up there, um, and then I, we didn't do it for a while, and then you know I'm doing Joe Wicks instead while I'm locked down. <laughs> so that's something. That's very aggressive. <laughs> I'm in miss. I am missing, you know, views because we, you know, I live around a lot of houses. You know, there's just there's no views around here. Um, the 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 prom is with the the Maisies. I get got a good hour walk away from here. Really, it's only a ten minute drive, but like by the time we got the kids there, it's an hour walk. Uh, so we haven't really gone that far. But it, so I'm missing views. So as soon as this all finishes, I'm going. I'm going back up to the walk on the hills thing. I bet. Yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine. I mean, it is. It's, I, it's exactly things like that. You suddenly realise that actually being able, having a long view is a real luxury. Yeah. I'm, I'm really fortunate because I can see water from my window. And I think that's, you know, it's like it's always been important to me living near a big sky and kind of water. And I, I've actually been walking more mainly to escape everyone in my house. <laughs> Bye, everybody. I'm going to listen to a good podcast. In fact, two crime writers and a microphone. Oh. That's one of Luca's other uh, strings to his bow, uh, amongst others, and uh, just go out for a bit and just, you know, it's that kind of decompression, isn't it, to get away from the mm. house and a change of scene, I think. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, it's just tricky. It is. But, um, I, you know, Luca was talking about how his schedule was, was messed up musically and stuff like that, but you had this book coming out 
and and uh, I, was this July it was coming out when I was 10 in Hardback? No, it's not out until August. Um, oh, so that was already planned, was it? It hasn't, yeah, but there's there have been some sort of events that were kind of planned around it, and I, I don't think a decision has yet been made about publication. I think and my publisher, as far as I'm aware, is kind of looking at things on a month-by-month -month basis and making decisions um, based on that. So... Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, at the moment, it's slated for August the 6th. But, um, yeah, I mean, that could all change. Who knows? This must be, I mean, like, because th this is a kind of a new venture for you in, in, in a way. It's a kind of change of focus. As I understand it, I haven't read it yet. But as I understand it, you, you know, it's a kind of slightly different book from, from the books that started with Rattle and things like that. There's a kind of... Yeah, you know, I mean, I think for this, it, I am... Um, I... My, my previous three books have all had detectives in them, detective characters, but my background is in journalism and I really wanted to write a novel with a journalist um, as a protagonist, um, unpeeling the layers of the story, I suppose, as it were. So, um, and I, I, I love her. I've created, a, she's, a, she's a newspaper, national newspaper journalist. Uh, she likes eating. She's not super thin. Um, you know, people always complain about characters that never eat in the novels. And, you know, she she likes food and uh, she she's in love with someone that's, you know, hasn't really expressed much of an interest in her. And it was fun to create a character like that, a bit different from a detective. Um, but also, more importantly, um, what I wanted to do was have a story that um, unpeels what happens behind a breaking news story and how things can either escalate really rapidly and the story gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, that's what happens when you write newspaper stories. Sometimes, you know, you think something's going to be a big story and it just falls away because, you know, all the pieces aren't in the right place. And then sometimes things can happen. There's a chain of events that make a story bigger. And that's what happens um, in this book. That's a part of it. Um, but I loved, I really enjoyed writing this book. Um, you know, I've had lots of lovely feedback about it. Um, and it was inspired, actually, by something I read about Mary Bell. And I'm sure lots of your um, kind of pe people watching this will know who she is. But she she killed um, two children when she was 10 years old. And mm -hmm. I was fascinated by this little thing that I read about her, which was, um, she was living her life quite happily. She'd, she'd served her time um, and the press found out where she was living. They found out what her real name was. And at three o'clock in the morning, they surrounded her house and they were preparing to unmask her true identity. And she had to wake up her young daughter um, and tell her who she really was. And that just that idea of having, to, you know, I put myself in her shoes and I imagine having to tell your your child that, you know, you were a killer. Um, so that's part of it. I'm exploring the idea of, you know, can we do people ever deserve redemption, forgiveness? Can you redeem yourself? Um, so, yeah, lots of ideas about press freedoms, um, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot in it. Yeah, journalists probably don't come out of it uh, brilliantly, considering you were well in that whole life for a while. Um, I tried really hard to write it um, in an as balanced way as possible because I do, you know, I don't excuse journalists at all in it, but by the same token, you know, I worked with a lot of people and I'm still friends with a lot of people who I would consider to have a great deal of integrity. And actually, journalists are really easy targets, but, you know, there, there are lots of us who cared very much about what we wrote and how it affected people um, and so I wanted to get a flavour of that in there too without excusing the behaviour of, of some journalists so there are of course journalists who are nicer than others I would say. Yeah um, there's a question from David Fennell who is a, is a writer himself um, do you listen to music when writing if so tell us um, Luca do you listen to music can it or does it distract you completely? No I have to um, I can't abide silence at all so i mean it's it's something that i've just i started when i started writing i had music on and it's just i thought it was normal and then you talk to some people and they have to write in like complete silence and then you have the really weird people who can write with the telly on um which i don't understand at all do you watch something <laughs> but, uh, i have music on um there'll be i mean and, and i just have like a playlist that i just add to all the time uh, so it's not even like special music i don't have like you know uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or something playing. It's like, or a soundtrack from a film. It's it's usually like Stormzy going into Childish Gambino, going oh. into the Osmonds, going into Abbe, going into you know. It's just totally random stuff. Um, so I mean, it's just 
I, I can't handle silence, which is, you know, the main character in the six. That's where that comes from. Is like it's I, me. I, yeah. Well, I, well, well. I asked the same thing of Fiona. I want to talk about music as well. But, 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 Fiona, do you do you work in silence? No, God, no. I, you know, there's too much noise and distraction going on in this house. But I do. I listen to music sometimes as well. And sometimes I have kind of a sort of soundtrack um, to my books. In that I particularly remember this with Rattle, I played um, Johnny Cash over and over again. Um, and I played, um, <laughs> you know, that song Titanium, you shoot me down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my singing's really bad. But um, I had that on a lot of time, really high maximum volume. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm the same as Luca in that I don't understand people who say they need absolute silence. I can work in any amount of noise. I can work with the television on. And I think some of that's come comes from the journalism mm. background. We used to have to file copy from, you know, a noisy pub. Or I think I've been on board a boat when I filed copy before or an airport or, you know, all sorts of places. And you just tune out the background noise. And I luckily I can still do that now. But I love I love listening to music. Um, my favorite bit, though, of the writing process is when you finish the book and then you can have your music on really loud and drink a nice cold beer <laughs> and celebrate the end of it. I think that's the best bit. Wouldn't you agree? Today, then, by the look of things, by the look of your glass. But I used to work in music magazines. In fact, Caroline Grimshaw, who's there cropping up in the comments, was the designer for a magazine called Zigzag that I worked with ages ago. And then I worked for Smash It. But of course, those offices would, in Smash It, sometimes there'd be two record players on simultaneously. And if you couldn't work for that, you couldn't work. Do so, you listen um, to music? I do. And I, I mean, I do. And I, I can. I, do, when I say I listen to it, if I'm writing, I'm actually not listening in a way. But I quite often put on a French station called FIP because it's really brilliant. A, it's really brilliant music. It's really weird and wiggy. You know the way the Parisians, they like everything from the Rolling Stones to jazz and, and all that sort of like dark stuff. So it's got some great programming, but also all the news is in French. So it's just straight in my head, which is really useful as well. <laughs> um, but you know, if the kids come up to me and talk for five minutes, I haven't got a clue what they've said because I just, um, you know, put that box around me. But anyway, I put six on the screen. I've got loads of comments to come up. We're getting very far behind on this, but six, which was Luca Vesti's most recent novel. And, um, you know, that and The Bonekeeper were a kind of change of pace from the series. But this is this starts in something that's very familiar to you. It starts in a music festival. As somebody, as the Glastonbury headliner that you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they played Glastonbury last year. They played Glastonbury last year. I actually said to the band afterwards that that should have been our last gig. You can never get <laughs> the top, Glastonbury. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the music festival, actually, I, I wrote that uh, scene before we played Glastonbury. So and I'd never been to a music festival before. Um, but it, it was just, it fit, it fit with the whole story about you know, why these people are, uh, are where they are. And it just, it, I thought that would be, you know, perfect setting for it. Um, but... Yeah, it's, really a, it's about a bad thing that happens at that music festival. Yeah. They kind of wash it under the carpet, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, you know, six friends in their thirties who are kind of all all about to move on in their lives. You know, they're they're, they're getting married, they're having children, and this is like their last blowout before they kind of uh, embrace you know adulthood properly. Um, and something happens during one night, um, which kind of they try to cover up, but a year later. Uh, things start happening, which means that someone saw what they did or knows what they did. I'm sorry, I'm going through comments now. We've got a lot of love coming out for when I was 10. So a lot of, you sent it out on, on NetGalley, didn't you? So I, I think it's on NetGalley and um, Goodreads. And I think some proofs have, were sent out a little while ago. Not not loads, but some, I think. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's had some really lovely feedback so far. And I, But it was an absolute joy to write. You know, some books are just like that, aren't they? You kind of you know where you're going with them. Um, and I knew right from the very start how it was going to be structured and how what was going to happen. And so that made the writing of it more of a pleasure than uh, my current novel that I'm writing. As well, um, how, you know, it, there's a twist and it's kind of important to what, you know, how it unfolds. Did you know what you're going to write? Did you have that all set up before you before you ventured out? I always, um, and this I makes me sound a, a bit uh -oh. weird, but right. I, I always know what the ending's going to be. So, and I know probably, I don't really know much that, that happens in between, but I'd probably know what any twists or kind of the rug, the rug from under the feet pulling moments are. I generally have an, an idea of those and then I just write it 
but I don't really plan and I just sit down at my computer and then start at the beginning and then write to the end. Um, and I'm a bit scared to change that writing process in case it doesn't work. So that's just what I've done with every book. Did you know the end of it? Did you know that twist it in in um, in six? In the six? Yeah. Um, yeah, of a fashion. Yeah, I knew there was going to be a, a big reveal, um, and uh, and uh, I did. I was working towards that, um, so I kind of had that in mind all the way through um, of writing it, which is unusual, really, because usually I have four or five. If the Bone Keeper, for example, the ending that was published was about the fifth or sixth draft of that. Um, right. And it was the fifth or sixth explanation of what was going on because that book was one of those where it was so um, mystical and, and could be, it could have gone in many different directions with it. I, I wasn't sure what, what I was going to do with it. Um, and it did take a few time, a few goes at it to, to kind of get it where I wanted it. Uh, whereas with the six, I kind of knew where it was I wanted to end up. Um, what came very late on was the the very end chapter um which was a very late edition which i'm so glad i did do in the end um because that is the thing that people always mention after reading it um so but that every book has been different for me i don't know about you fiona but every book has a kind of different process about how i write it how it comes together what characters kind of come to the fore which ones i enjoy writing more which ones I, i'm like this is boring i don't want to go in that direction and and changed my mind halfway through. Um, but every book has been different like that. Absolutely. I think every book is a different, it's a different experience. I mean, I mm. my process sort of tends to stay the same in that I just I don't jump around, I just write chronologically and then I just start writing until I get to the end. But in terms <laughs> of there's, there's definite moments um which you know, definite books which are, I have preferred writing. I do just want to say to everyone, we said this earlier, but I'm not actually dead. Um, my face is not normally this white. I'm sitting in front of a big window and I can't get the blinds to come down. So I know I look very pale. But I'm vitamin D deficiency is really <laughs> getting rough on your face. <laughs> but I'm fine. I'm trying to move back. Let me move back a bit. We're getting a lot of love from the six now from Philippa Hall, who's a book blogger who's been on here, from some bloke called Steve Kavanagh. Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> the six is excellent. Loved it. Thank you. And, Thank um, you very much. Oh, um, there's Shay Griffiths has said, and this is my, are the neighbour over till Norsk? How do you like my Norwegian, Shay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, Shay. I mean, have it been translated into Norwegian? See, I, I'm I'm getting there with my Duolingo. This is what I think, I'm doing. I'm I think I saw that the my Norwegian translators watching. So yeah, perhaps they could provide a translation. <laughs> It is. Oh, look, trust me. I've done I've done at least a week of Duolingo now. <laughs> Duolingo's um, good. I like Duolingo. I love it. Mick Finley says hi. Uh, so does Andy Hill says the Bone Keeper was creepy. Will there be a follow-up? I hope so. Um, it hasn't, it's not happening at the moment, but it was left in a position where I could go back to it any time I want. Um, and that's something I really want to do um, because I'm not done with that character yet. But I think that happens with a lot of people who write standalones is that they feel like there's there is more to tell in that story and more to to bring out from those characters it's just that sometimes the the idea that the the kind of carries a whole book doesn't always come and then you get lost in doing four or five and then it's too late um but i do hope that i go back to it at some point because uh, i love the character of louise in that book i loved writing her um she's one of my favorite characters i've ever i've ever written for and yeah i really hope i can get back to it at some point um there was a guy called steve kavanagh who, who's, who's uh watching but you you do and this brings us to two two crime writers and a microphone you've just done your hundredth episode congratulations yeah. i mean that is that's a bit of a thing isn't it yeah i mean we, we <laughs> and the title of the episode is how did we get this far because we're not sure um, <laughs> And when we start, I mean, like Steve came up with the idea, and he just basically got in touch with me and said, "Like, can we do this?" And I went, "Yeah, probably." And and we and we kind of did three episodes at the beginning, um, and we thought, if no one listens to this, we'll still do it because it be, you know, it's it's just fun. Because what we realised quite quickly is that me and Steve bounce off off each other really, really well. So even though we've ne we we do it from two different countries. Um, you, you know, people are always surprised when we tell them that. Um, it sounds like we're in the same room most of the time. Um, 
and it's honestly been the the funniest times I've ever had in my life have been just sitting there in front of a a, a computer screen hearing Steve laugh is is <laughs> glorious. Um, it's and we describe it as the the best worst crime book podcast around because we try and talk about books. It never really works out that way. Yeah, um, I think we've already talked about books more than you know fifty percent of your episode, quite frankly. But that's fine. <laughs> but it is. It's such. It's so much fun. We do silly things. We talk, and we what we do is we want what we want to re recreate. And this is something that Steve was really uh, impressive on, impressing on me at the beginning was that he wanted it to be, and I agreed. Um, I, I kind of you're listening in on a conversation that we would have in a bar at two o'clock in the morning at a crime festival with other authors, and that's kind of what we've tried to re recreate. And, and I think we've we've done that a lot. So we've had you know we had Val McDermott on for our hundredth episode. We talk about books. She's on for an hour and a half. We talk about books for about 10, 15 minutes. The rest of the time is us just chatting to Val and finding out things about Val that you know you wouldn't really find out and just hearing stories and and hearing about her life is just more interesting to me to so your 37th novel you know like how did it feel writing that i you know that that there is a place for that but yeah. we've we've just kind of wanted to recreate that bar at two o'clock in the morning at a crime festival field I, I think you're being very generous to how much sense that bar at two o'clock in the morning I <laughs> 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 that is true <laughs> I'm glad I've been on it's been very entertaining but I, don't think I like your, um, your recent episode with um, Mark Billingham and Martin Waits, where you found oh. those clips from all the the TV oh, yeah. shows that they've been in. Mark Mark Billingham and Martin Waits have have both been actors in previous in a previous career, uh, and we but had them on the show a, a, a couple of times, and it's like a good year or two ago, and we we talked about that. And one day I happened across um, a clip of, I think it was Mark in, a, in an advert for Nike or something. And I thought, so that's funny. And then it just instantly thought, what we should do is a retrospective. What we should do is we should, we should go through and find every single appearance that they've had. And I know it's audio based, so it's a bit more difficult to, to imagine, but we did throw up all the links afterwards. But we went through every single episode of things that they've been in. So Mark had been in, uh, Juliet Bravo and the Bill <laughs> and Dempsey and Make Peace and the Upper Hand and Birds of Feather and Martin had been in in similar show the Bill uh, Spender um, and we we I grabbed audio clips from all of these episodes. It took me three four days to put it all together and I thought this could fall apart because I didn't tell them that we were it's doing really it. Really funny. And I thought this could fall apart in the first five minutes if they say we're not doing this. Really. Doing? <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't it was the oh, no, it's brilliant. It, it's the, the oh, most fun I've had ever. It was just the funniest like it's two hours we've ever had. Because they're just ripping the piss out of themselves in the most yeah. delightful way, aren't they? That's it. Um we've got Hugo from uh, uh Norwegian Three Norwegians, I'm counting them. This is the biggest Norwegian audience. <laughs> any, any, uh, anything I, think. I should actually say, I just did a deal yesterday for Gravesend in Norway. So, um, hey, congratulations, cheers. Susan Tuck. Um, uh, Hugo says, uh, What are you most happy about? Six is the title of your book, as six as being the number of times Liverpool has won the Champions League. Um, that Liverpool <laughs> winning yeah. the Champions League is more yeah. important than anything. But <laughs> Luke, what happened with the football season? I don't. Yeah. It's 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 the worst. Like it, you know, like it's a terrible time and everything like that. But I mean, thirty years we've been waiting for this, and the, the idea that this happened this year, it was it, it's horrible. I mean, I think for, I think the season will hopefully finish. I think it'll be behind clo closed doors. And there will always be that asterisk next to it because we can't. When Liverpool won the Champions League, for example, last year, there's I think eight hundred thousand people on the streets of Liverpool when they bring the trophy back. You can't do that no. this year. Um, so what's going to have to happen is as soon as we can allow to 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 have mass gatherings, is that we just win it again. That's that's what I'm hoping. Hmm. Uh, you know what? I'm completely football agnostic. I generally couldn't give a toss, but Liverpool have done it with such. Oh, the Race this year, haven't they? Do you know what I mean? They've been so great as a team. There you go. That's the most I've ever talked about football. In <laughs> and, 
And Jay says, I was asking Fiona's translation if it was translated into Norwegian, you see? My Norwegian oh, is okay. Well, I think the collector has only just come out in Norway. Because um, I think, I mean, I don't know whether you guys find it, but the translations are often a couple of years behind or a year or so behind and stuff. So um, not yet, but yeah, my newest well, one in Norway is the collector. The thing about Norwegians, bless them, is they spend about £35 on a hardback, which, you know, they love books and they buy books for proper money, unlike mm. some other countries. Um, I'm just trying to go through comments. N Neighbour has not been translated, but I've read it. It says, oh, there's more Norwegians. Um, <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask, ask you, and I, I think, you know, you've got a really rich imagination i think right from the from right at the beginning um the collector and stuff it's a bizarre world and you don't mind conjuring really bizarre worlds and bizarre people in the world were you were you a lonely child or something where does it all <laughs> you know, I, was very dark, I was a very dark child i was always the one that was interested in dead things um <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm generally fairly sunny natured, I would say. Um, I just I think I'm fascinated, I suppose, by the line that we all tread, which is that there is probably, you know, whether you like it or not, there's probably darkness within all of us in some capacity. Um, and I'm really fascinated by that idea. And I think, you know, there's a theme I, I've noticed and it's not really deliberate at all, but it's obviously something that interests me that runs through all of my books, which is that, you know, I've said it before, but the kind of shades of grey that, you know, nobody that kills or does absolutely awful things to others is all bad. And in the same way that your heroes, are, you know, they're not all good. The, the much more interesting people to me are those who, you know, don't know to which depths they might plumb or you know, good people that do really bad things or bad people that, you know, love something or, you know, so I, I'm fascinated by this kind of interplay between the two. And I think that features a lot in, in, in all of my books. Look, are you, what, are you, what are you up to next? I mean, what comes out after the six? Um, it should be later this year, a book called The Game, um, which is about a game. Um, it says what it does on the tin. It does what it says on the tin. Um, and that is, uh, it's been a book that I've been working on for about three years um, that, that hasn't really ever worked until recently. Uh, so hopefully that'll be out in November, but who knows at this point. Um, but the, the, that's, um, that, that book is, because it's been so long in the process, it's, been, it's always been like that, that kind of, that, that, you know, like kind of hurdle to get over is to try and get that book right. Um, because that book was supposed to come out before the six and didn't because oh, really? yeah. it just didn't work. Um, so yeah, so it's that. And then the book after that is the book that has been a, a, a real labor of love for a while now, uh, which led me to go into um, New England and in, in America uh, at the beginning of March before all this lockdown started, which is a book that will be set in England and America, which is the first time I've ever done that. I never usually leave Liverpool, which. <laughs> <laughs> Do you because so you did did you ditch the game then um, before you wrote the six because I just it's so difficult to do that isn't it Yeah, I've done it. I've done it twice as well. I've done that twice. Um, so the game I did four different versions of it and it just was not coming together. So I ended up writing the six in like two months and that barely needed any editing. Um, and it just shows you that it's it's sometimes just the book and not not yeah the idea isn't it because I was how much you love them. And, and how good they are have nothing to do with each other, do they? Do you know what I mean? It's They really surprise you in that kind of way, if that doesn't sound a bit too pretentious. What are you working on, anyway, Fiona, at the moment? I'm working on my fifth book at the moment, um, which is basically about a family who completely disappear off the face of the earth. Um, but I think, you know, I'm finding um, it's just a different process, but um, it's... <sighs> What to say about it really it's got a returning character and it's got i've gone back to having a detective but those people who've read my earlier books might recognize a detective in it um which has been great fun it is great fun to write it is a very dark character um so i'm enjoying it um but yeah i mean i have kind of lots of different ideas on the go probably like most people at the same time and i think i don't necessarily believe in the concept of writer's block but 
what I think is um, when you can't write, it's often because you've run out of ideas or the idea hasn't got enough legs, I think. And I, so, um, you know, if that ever happens, then I think, well, I need to do something more. I need to introduce another strand or I need to kind of change things about. But yeah, I mean, I'm yeah working on my fifth book, which I can hardly believe I'm saying really. I never, I never really imagined to have more than one published, so. Hi, Barry from Phil, Philly. Um, who, who, um, Keith says, is the other book an Inspector Mallard, Luca? Now, you see that? <laughs> You're going to have to provide some context for me on that one. <laughs> uh, that was, that's one of the, I mean, because it is, I think someone said earlier that the podcast is very much a stream of consciousness and that the podcast uh, generated like the, 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 a long recurring character within very early on. This is like three and a half years ago when we started. It was one of the very early episodes. We created a character called Inspector Mallard, which was a duck detective. <laughs> um, and I think he's up there actually somewhere in the, on the shelf. Um, uh, and we would we would we were literally asking people for stories, from, which in, which involved Inspector Mallard, and we didn't get any. Uh, but <laughs> but it was. Um, Someone must have made the bill joke, mustn't they? Yeah, that, oh yeah, that came up very early on. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's that's one of the things about the, the podcast though is that that stream of consciousness brings out things like Inspector Mallard, which. Every time I sit down to write a book, I think I could sit here and write, you know, a normal book, or I could write something that comes from the podcast, which might be much more fun. Would sell no copies and, yeah. <laughs> and would get me dropped from the publisher that is paying <laughs> my rent. <laughs> but it would be much more fun. <laughs> no one wants to know: Are there any areas you avoid? Any sort of no-go zones for writing? Fiona, do you have any no-go zones? You've written some very dark bits and pieces. Yeah, I mean, I think probably there are there are a couple of things i suppose so i you know i think there is a place for them for sure um but i don't particularly enjoy reading novels that involve um child sex abuse for example that's and i don't know whether that's because i have children of my own or i don't know but that's an area that i'm i'm not i don't really want to write about but then you know i'm loath to say never say you know say never because you never know what might happen but um so that probably, um, and I, you know, although I kind of alluded briefly to Mary Bell when I was talking about my new book, um, I think writing about cases, sort of cases in the news that are quite recent, I would feel quite uncomfortable about doing where you knew that parents, for example, you know, for example, something like Madeleine McCann or, you know, the Bulger killings, those kind of things, I would, I would find that a, a bit trickier. Um, but, you know, I don't, I think it's difficult to say, anything's off limits because I you know there might be an idea that catches my attention and then I decide that I just want to write it um but you know there are many people that can do things very better than I can so I'll leave it to them um but yeah I mean I do go to dark places um but I think some of that is because as a writer you can control the fate of the characters on your page you know real life is very different um and writing books gives you an element of control over that I think as about you, Luca? I mean, it's a. I think you know, child, children, they're difficult. What about animals? Yeah, I've, I'll, well, I, I will never kill an animal, but that's just ridiculous. You, I, and I think you would get more letters for killing an animal than you would for yeah, killing a child. True. Is it just is is yeah interesting? Um, I, I could have given the exact same answer as Fiona. She said it way better than I could. I think, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's also certain things that I couldn't do. That I've had. I've had so many ideas and thought i can't do that because it matches something that's very raw still in liverpool um like like the james bulger case for example um so i, I don't tend to i th tend to think about things like that where it's like could i stand this up if someone started questioning me about it could i defend myself from accusations of being you know a bit lurid and gratuitous um so i tend to stay away from that but I, I'd never say never on anything, um, and because uh, otherwise I could get to book twenty-seven and go, I've got nothing left. I'm, I've got, and I, and I need something. I've got this one idea that I really want to do, and I would have yeah, to do um, it at some point. I love the idea that the, the, when Mark Billingham decided to write about a cat killer, I was thinking that can never work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's ludicrous thing to want to do. Well, somehow, and it really annoys yeah. me. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, damn, damn. Listen, I try and wrap this up after 30 minutes. We've gone on for 40. Um, 
which is time flies when you're having fun. And it's been a, been a real laugh having you both here. And um, cheers, basically. This that's, is pure, this is whiskey, if that's... Um, excellent, cheers. I'm getting sponsored by Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks as well. Thanks for thanks for the questions. Yeah, thanks very much. It's been brilliant seeing all the questions coming up. Many Norwegians, and um, see you all again. See you in the flesh at two o'clock in the morning and in a festival bar. Obviously, oh, hopefully really soon as well, or not yes. too long. Great. All the best. Thanks very much.